So as we look at Van Til's point about the Spirit's testimony to natural revelation after the fall, his point is this. The new relation pertains both to Adam and the revelation of God after the fall. The revelation of God before the fall in nature did not disclose wrath. The revelation of God in nature after the fall does disclose wrath. Just as Adam changes in relation to God, so natural revelation and the content of it undergoes a corresponding change in history. This doesn't mean, of course, God is changing, but it means that there is a new relation between God and Adam after the fall. Now, Van Til's point is that Roman Catholic theology, traditional Roman Catholic theology, cannot affirm this concrete Reformed conception of sin and natural revelation corresponding to sin. He says this in page 61 of Common Grace and the Gospel, to avoid a natural theology of the Roman sort, we shall need to come to something like a clear consciousness of the difference between a Christian and non-Christian mode of argument with respect to the revelation of God in nature. Now let me give you background on that distinction. You need to understand this. By Christian, Van Til has in view reformed. Now that might, might sound strange to you, but if you'll remember uh, Warfield in his taxonomy, in the plan of salvation, begins by distinguishing naturalism and supernaturalism, sacerdotalism and Protestantism, and then universalism and particularism. And he reasons that particularism, which is Calvinism, is the most consistent expression of supernaturalistic, non-universalistic Protestantism. As we've, saw, as we've seen in our previous module, Van Til turns that upside down and begins with particularism. And he says, Calvinism is Christianity come to its own. So when Van Til talks about a Christian mode of argument. He doesn't have in view a C.S. Lewis genericism, a mere Christianity. He has in view Calvinism as Christianity come to its own. And then the non-Christian mode of argument with respect to the revelation of God in nature has at least two expressions. First, Van Til wants to set a reformed view of natural revelation over against a standard enlightenment view of nature. Remember, a standard garden variety natural theology, a natural, uh, an enlightenment naturalism, sees nature as a neutral field of objective facts that are not inherently revelatory of God. Neutral field of objective facts, not revelatory of God. If you think, for instance, of Hume's philosophy, what is nature but a bundle of perceptions in varying relations? But they are more like billiard balls on a table than they are revelational modes of God. The, that, that Humean view of nature has no place for the revelation of God. Or if you, if you think of Kant, Kant sought to turn away from nature toward the knowing subject, and he found objectivity in the synthetic a priori categories of the understanding. But those categories of the understanding are not revelatory of God. Van Til is saying, a reformed conception of nature says that God reveals himself through the facts that are outside of Adam and in Boving's language, implants a knowledge of himself in the creature, the image bearer. 
And so when Van Til says we have to be explicit and have a clear consciousness of the difference between a Christian and non-Christian mode of argument with respect to the revelation of God in nature, the first thing he's precluding is some enlightenment view of objective natural facts devoid of revelation. But secondly, he wants to set a reformed view of the natural knowledge of God over against a traditional Thomistic view of the natural knowledge of God. Now, to summarize from our previous module, the former, the Reformed view, the natural knowledge of God is concreated, implanted, and inalienable in Adam before and after the fall. So the so no matter what Adam does by way of discursive reasoning, the knowledge of God is implanted, concreated, and inalienable in him from the very instant he is formed as an image bearer, and it endures even after the fall. The difference is Adam welcomes that knowledge, worships God in terms of that knowledge before the fall, and after the fall, as we've seen, suppresses it. But the traditional Roman Catholic view, represented by Thomas, the natural knowledge of God is not concreated, but attainable after the fall, pending a proper reasoning process. You remember, for traditional Roman Catholic theology, its view of revelation of God in nature, the only thing concreated in Adam before the fall is the inner light of reason. And you could call it a bare capacity a naked capacity, as it were, because the knowledge of God is not implanted but acquired through an inferential process. Van Til makes it clear here on page 61 in Common Grace and the Gospel that we must avoid a traditional natural theology of the Roman sort and says instead we need a robustly Calvinistic and Reformed natural theology. Now, if this sounds like what we were saying in the previous module, it is. Here's what Van Til says on pages 61 and 62 as his argument develops. He says, God is and has been from the beginning revealed in nature and in man's consciousness. And so, remember, when we're over here talking about the natural revelation in, with reference to pre-fall Adam, that natural revelation comes from outside of Adam, and then by virtue of his creation, it is implanted inside of Adam. This is Common Grace in the Gospel 61 and 62. The natural revelation of God comes from without, from outside of Adam, in nature. It's also implanted inside of Adam as an image bearer. And Van Til goes on to say this. We cannot say that the heavens probably declare the glory of God. We cannot allow that if rational argument is carried forth on true premises, it should come to any other conclusion than that the true God exists. Nor can we allow that the certainty with respect to God's existence would be any less if acquired by a ratiocinative process rather than by intuitions as long as man was not a sinner. Here's the quote, listen. The testimony of the Spirit may be well conceived as originally controlling Adam's reasoning powers as well as his intuitive powers. Now, here's what's review and then here's what's not. What's review is that Van Til is saying that in natural revelation, God reveals himself outside of Adam in nature and inside of Adam in his consciousness. Whether Adam looks to the starry heavens above or looks introspectively inside of himself, he knows God. God has revealed himself. What he's adding now, as we're looking at common grace, 
is this, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit testifies, the Holy Spirit testifies to that reality before and after the fall. The Spirit originally in Eden testified to the truth of God's revelation in Adam as the image of God, as well as testified through nature outside of Adam as the image of God. And Van Til says that both his intuition, what he knows without a thought process, and his ratiocination, that is, his reasoning process, in both instances, in both operations, intuition and inference, the Spirit is testifying to the inescapable atmosphere of revelation outside of Adam and inside of Adam. Adam was enveloped in a revelatory environment from without and within. Before the fall, Adam God, Adam knew God intuitively as well as discursively in a natural bond of religious fellowship. By intuitive powers, Adam knew God instantly upon his creation. He was formed, in Voss's language, in natural religious fellowship with God. Original righteousness was gifted to him. Original holiness was gifted to him. Original knowledge was gifted to him. If you want to put it in the way Herman Bovink puts it in his Reformed Dogmatics, the natural knowledge of God was implanted within him. He was inclined toward God, and in all of his capacities, God gave impressions of himself to Adam, both exterior and interior. That's Bovink's way of putting it. Voss calls this the deeper Protestant conception. So, before Adam ever had any inferential process in his mind at all, he knew God by virtue of implanted, gifted knowledge. Calvin's semen religionis, Calvin's sensus divinitatis. But from our Ventil quote on pages 61 and 62, he also says, by his ratiocination, by his rational process, he could acquire ever-ascending knowledge of God as he walked in fellowship with God and submitted to his verbal revelation. In other words, Adam was not only gifted knowledge of God, but through reasoning and light of God's revelation in nature outside of him, and submitting to God's special revelation given to him instantly upon his creation, Adam could know God by virtue of a process of reason. To put it in Van Til's language, he knew God both by a ratiocinative process and by an implanted knowledge, both by a reasoning process and by intuition. The intuitive and the ratiocinative, in Ventil's language, worked together and forged the foundation for that natural religious fellowship in which Adam was created with God. That is the concrete reality the Spirit testifies to. Ventil says that the Spirit originally testified in a non-redemptive way to this very reality before the fall. The Spirit testified to the intuitive knowledge of God that was implanted in Adam. The Spirit testified to the ratio-native knowledge of God that could be attained by Adam. The Spirit testified to the revelation within Adam in the book of conscience and all around Adam in the book of nature. The natural religious fellowship implanted, could be deepened at every point as Adam worshipped God with all of his rational powers, intuitive or ratiocinative. Now, that's, if I can put it this way, that's the concrete reality to which the Spirit testifies. 
That is not affirmed in traditional Roman Catholic theology about the image of God or about natural knowledge of God. So the Spirit testifies to that concrete reality. Now, to, to expand on what we've said before, what happens in the new relation of Adam's sin and misery? When Adam sins against God and the relation to God changes, as we've said before, moves from favor to wrath, what happens? Well, listen to what Van Til says. Uh, continuing down now on 62. He says, all of this changed when Adam sinned. He says that when the new relation of sin emerged, you have, quote, you have this, quote, on the one hand, when man had become a sinner, his intuitive powers are as sinful as his reasoning powers. There may be more area for error in sorites, that is a chain of syllogisms in suggestion, in succession, than in intuition, but the corruption of sin has penetrated to every activity of man. Now please hear this. This is not what traditional Roman Catholic theology teaches. When Adam sinned, he lost the supernatural gifts of righteousness and holiness and fellowship with God, but his natural powers of reason and will were left virtually untouched. We'll look at that later. Van Til's saying, that's not true. When Adam sinned against God, the implanted knowledge he had by way of intuition, that faculty of intuition became just as darkened as his faculty of reasoning, ratiocination, so that he was sinful in his intuitions and in his inferences. A comprehensive noetic effect of sin, both in intuition and inference. Van Til is explicit and detailed that sin corrupted both the intuitive and ratiocinative functions of Adam at the time point of his fall into sin. Thus, in the fall, Adam, in the totality of his being, in his intuitive and inferential activities, began to suppress the natural revelation of God in him, the natural revelation of God outside of him, and the testimony of the Spirit to both. This is Van Til's point. This is coming back now in more detail to what we said earlier. Sin affects the totality of man's relation to God, Adam's relation to God before the fall. The internal general revelation of God, made known intuitively, suppressed. The external general revelation of God, made known initially intuitively and then discursively, is suppressed. And as he came to suppress and reject the internal general testimony of the Spirit, he did so as he rejected the natural revelation of God. Now, Van Til says, making this obvious, this is, we believe, the sense of Calvin's Institutes on the matter. Now just pause there for a moment and recognize what's happening. Van Til is not replacing traditional Thomistic natural theology with an undefined general idea of Reformed theology. He is replacing it with what he calls to be Calvin's view of the matter. And this underwrites a thesis that we've seen in the previous course and we're seeing now, Calvin's doctrine of implanted, concreated natural knowledge joined to Calvin's doctrine of the totalizing effects of the fall mean that when Adam passes from favor to wrath and enters into this new relation to God, there is a conspiracy of witnesses against him. Not only does his conscience bear witness against him, but the wrath of God is revealed from heaven and the Spirit testifies 
to that wrath as Adam continues to suppress it. And so Van Til's point here is, is amplified in this way. He says, every man by his sinful nature seeks violently to suppress the voice of God that keeps on speaking within him through his created nature. If we take both the original human nature and the sinful human nature and realize that everywhere both are active, we have done once and for all away with the natural theology of Rome. Now that's a critical statement because Van Til sets this confessionally reformed view of creation and fall over against the traditional natural theology of Rome. And as we continue to explore Van Til, and we look at him more deeply as we move on, you need to recognize this, that who Adam is as a creature, once he falls, introduces a dynamic and organic relation between pre-fall and post-fall Adam that occasions, in this transition, a new relation to natural revelation and a new relation to the Holy Spirit characterized by what Van Til calls here violent suppression of God's voice. The voice of the Spirit, as it were, testifying to what is true of man. And we'll continue to look at this and clarify even more what Van Til wants to say by way of expanding this for a doctrine of common grace.